My name is Amanda Sisson. I'm an associate with Org Code Consulting. Um, I'm one of the uh, quote unquote bench players with Org Code. Um, and I want to thank the Texas Homeless Network for having Org Code um, do the VI Spit At uh, webinar today. Um, I was in Texas back in, I think, April. I was in Abilene and Denton. So it's good to kind of be virtually in Texas again. And um, I was rooting for the Astros last night, by the way. So yeah, go Astros. <laughs> <laughs> My kids are both baseball players, so we were way into um, into the World Series last night in the past few weeks, so go Astros. Um, so today's going to be the VI SPIDAT training for single adults, transition aged youth, and families. So we'll go through the training today, and if you have any questions, uh, I guess just type them into the chat box and Craig will virtually answer them or if you want to hold them to the end, we'll go through questions at the end. We have about two hours for the webinar today. I don't anticipate taking the full two hours. So if you do have questions, um, we can certainly kind of work through those or you can email me uh, after the fact as well. All right, we should be transitioning. Okay, so what is the VI SPIT Act? So the VSPDAT, uh, for those of you who don't know, stands for the Vulnerability Index Service Prioritization Decision Assistance Tool, which is a mouthful. Um, the VSPDAT is often called a super tool. It combines the strengths of two existing assessments to help communities and programs target those most in need and help determine the uh, type of program or support that's most appropriate for the person who's experiencing homelessness at that time. It combines the vulnerability index, which was a tool used um, in New York a few years ago, and it combines it with the SPDAT prescreen, which the uh, SPDAT prescreen was originally part of the original SPDAT development. However, through working with Community Solutions as part of the 100,000 Homes campaign, uh, Org Code worked to develop what's now known as the VI SPDAT, which combines the vulnerability index with the SPDAT prescreen screen. So it gathers information from the vulnerability index piece and uses a binary scale in the pre-screen to measure the presence of an issue rather than the depth of an issue. So we're just looking at kind of surface stuff with the VI SPDAT. If we look at the full SPDAT, it dives much deeper into the client's uh, situation through using 15 different dimensions rather than just the quick pre-screen that only uses four dimensions. Uh, the VI SPDAT, though, can quickly determine whether a client has a high, moderate, or low acuity, acuity. And the beauty of the VI is that it can be used by communities that are very busy and do not have the resources to conduct that full SPDAT 15-dimension, um, very long assessment on every client who's entering the system. So with the VI, we are on version 2 of the single VI, and we're on version 2 of the family VI. We are on version one of the transition age youth VI. So in contrast um, from the VI SPDAT to the full SPDAT, again, the full SPDAT was developed as an assessment tool for frontline workers and agencies that work with homeless clients to prioritize which of those clients should receive assistance first. The SPDAT tools are also designed to help guide case management and improve housing stability outcomes. So. Um, I actually work in West Virginia. We use the full SPDAT tools to guide case management. So we prioritize through coordinated entry using the score determined from the VI SPDAT, but then once folks go into that housing intervention, we use the full SPDAT tools to really help guide that case management and improve their housing stability outcomes in the long run. As a result um, of of the full SPDAT requiring um, the assessor's ability to interpret the responses that are given uh, by the client and cooperate those uh, with evidence. The full SPDAT may only be used by those who have received proper up-to-date training by org code. Um, you technically don't have to have training to use the VI SPDAT, but having this background information through a training um, is always helpful to uh, frontline workers as well. But if you do want to use the full SPDAT tools um, in addition to using the VI SPDAT, tools, you do have to have a, a full day training provided by org code or an org code approved trainer. So that's my little uh, spiel on that one. Okay, so um, why the VI SPDAT? 
so we learned that we needed a system-wide tool to help guide the right household to the right support intervention at the right time to end their homelessness. The VSFID adds an objective approach to assessing needs for housing and life stability based on evidence. The language and the theoretical orientation um, is appropriate for housing-based case managers because it's very housing-based um, discussion uh, as you go through the tool. And it helped us as case managers um, and as frontline workers move away from this idea of first come, first serve, you walked in the door and I'm going to help you, um, to a more um, evidence-based approach and prioritization-based approach based on who needed the service most, not who was lucky enough to walk in the door first. By understanding the risk to housing stability, we're better able to promote homelessness proofing, and we needed a tool that that work for initial assessment as well as to help guide case management supports. Again, looking at that pre-screen or the VI spit at, and then using the full spit at to help guide the case management over time. So a little bit about the VI and the full spit at. It is the most frequently used triage assessment tool and case management tool in North America and Australia. It's also um, getting a little bit of interest from the UK as well. The only tools built from the experience of people who are homeless up to the academic level. So it, um, in the testing and in the research put into this for that, um, org code has used um, information from people who are experiencing homelessness all the way up to the academic level as well. It's been tested by third parties. Um, it's often been um, the replacement tool of choice for many communities across the country who used, originally used the VI, who used the DESC, uh, the HEART, the Camberwell, the Denver Acuity Scale, the Outcome Star, the uh, Self-Sufficiency Matrix, if you remember that. Um, I think that was the uh, Arizona Self-Sufficiency Matrix. It's also built into many HMIS platforms. It's structured to ensure local sustainability. Many communities um, have made the VSFIDAT the backbone um, to what they're doing towards ending homelessness. And it transcends population groups. So you can use it with youth, family, single adults, persons who are discharged from corrections or institutions. Um, there's also a prevention and diversion VSFIDAT, which we're not going to go over today. Um, but there are different um, VSFIDATs for different populations as well. So a little bit about what it doesn't do. It's not gonna make decisions for you. It's gonna help with the decision making. It's the decision assistance tool, not the decision making tool. It's not gonna provide any diagnosis for your clients. It's not gonna uh, take the place of any other clinical assessments as well. So you may have the VSFIDAT in use in your community and you may have other clinical assessment tools in in use in specific agencies as well, and that's okay. So it's not designed to take the place of any other clinical assessments that agencies may need to do. So what will the SPIDAT do? It's gonna help um, prioritize who to get, uh, who gets served next and why you're serving them next. It's gonna help uh, teams allocate their time, whether teams be, um, you know, local prioritization teams or street outreach teams, um, coordinated entry teams, it's going to help allocate uh, your time and, and better help you decide who to serve next and why. The full SPDA is going to measure changes in acuity over the course of time. So once we administer a VI SPDAT, we're not going to administer another VI SPDAT. That's when the full SPDAT would really take effect once the person gets into housing. And the full SPDAT allows for the measure of uh, acuity over time. So you would do the full SPDAT at set intervals, uh, at move in, at 30 days, at 60 days, at 90 days, um, and so on. And that full SPDAT would help provide a structured framework framework to case management service delivery as well. So keep in mind that again, it's a tool, it doesn't have a brain. Again, it's the decision assistance tool, not the decision making tool. There will likely be circumstances notwithstanding the spit at, especially the full spit at results that you choose to do something different um, than what the score actually says you should do. And those should be rare and should be documented in your community in accordance with your coordinated entry policies.
Again, the SPDAT results may be different than what you or your client thought. You might think that your client's very high acuity when in reality they're really not that high acuity and vice versa. So again, just looking at the differences between the SPDAT and the full SPDAT, the SPDAT is that full assessment, um, the triage is the potential participants into appropriate programs. Um, the VIA SPDAT allows communities to triage um, the triage. The full SPDAT um, identifies where issues exist and measures the depth of these issues. Um, the VI identifies whether or not an issue is present. So it's really that, um, you know, uh, holistic look um, at the outset of what's going on with the client rather than a dive deep into um, everything that's going on. So the SPDAT can be used from point of intake through case management. The VI is used to identify when a full assessment is appropriate. So we can use that, that VI SPDAT if there's questions, um, if there are multiple of the same score across the community, you could apply the full SPDAT as kind of that tiebreaker score that looks deeper into the client's issues. Um, some communities do that as well. So let's talk about the SPDAT in the context of coordinated access and common assessment. Um, give you a little visual here. So if we think of homelessness as um, kind of a black hole, and when I do this presentation live and not on a webinar, the, the black hole actually spins, which is kind of cool. It makes people dizzy, but um, we're not going to spin it uh, on the webinar. But if we think of homelessness as a black hole that people get sucked into, um, we realize and research shows us that um, if you don't have connections to job, there are things like jobs and housing and relationships, which are all outside of this black hole of homelessness, that you tend to get stuck in being homeless. And people who are homeless um, for a very long time have a very hard time getting out of homelessness. So people that um, have these connections to uh, jobs, to family, to relationships, uh, they can get out of that, uh, they get catapulted out of homelessness quicker than those who don't have those connections. Um, we also know that newly homeless persons tend to have these connections. Um, they do have connections to um, jobs. They may have had just a, a minor crisis. They do have these connections to families. Um, we know that people who are newly homeless tend to have these connections to these resources and they can actually escape out of this black hole of homelessness rather quickly. So we're gonna escape out. But people who are homeless for a very long time often do not have these connections and tend to be stuck in this black hole of homelessness. Our job should be to determine who is stuck in that black hole and to quickly get them out while simultaneously determining who is newly homeless, who can be quickly connected out to other resources through maybe even through diversion. Um, so the longer people are homeless, the further away these connections are and they need to be catapulted out because they're the ones that are stuck in that black hole of homelessness. So the VI really helps us to determine who's stuck, who's newly homeless, who has connections, and who can be catapulted out quickly. So as COCs across the country are working to implement coordinated entry, um, know that this process of using the VSPDA and using it for prioritization of persons who are experiencing homelessness can be applied in any model that you choose for your coordinated entry system, whether it be a centralized model, a decentralized model, a no wrong door, 211, um, hotline, hub based, any model you can apply the VI SPID at. If the by name list is continually being fed with assessments through your coordinated entry process, then clients are always being prioritized who needs the services the most, who can be um, connected to the housing resources that are available. Okay. So let's look at an example of people who are experiencing homelessness in our community. So let's just say, um, and I think there's seven uh, little graphics here, but let's just say that there's a hundred people who are surveyed. There's our seven people or our hundred people. 
example. Um, this is not a homogenous group. Um, we have this funnel of homeless services that are available in our community. So this is everything from uh, shelters to street outreach to transitional housing, to permanent supportive housing, anything that's available within our community um, or our centralized intake provider, um, any of our homeless services. So we take each of our individuals who are experiencing homelessness out of our 100 people that we're gonna survey, and we put them through our funnel of homeless services. So they're assessed either through outreach or through our centralized intake provider or at a shelter. So we're gonna assess them. We're gonna determine their acuity. My graphics are working. And we find out through this assessment that um, through the administration of the VI, research is gonna show us that about 80 people are just gonna need some general housing help or some case management, maybe prevention, maybe even diversion. These are people that can be really quickly catapulted out, are newly homeless people who just need a little bit of assistance. Our assessment is also going to show us that about 15 people will need rapid rehousing, and only about five people are going to need our most intensive uh, supportive services like permanent supportive housing or housing first. This is really based on Dennis Colhane's work on the typology of homelessness. So if you look up or Google the selected works of Dennis Colhane, uh, you can find out more about this. But his works basically said through years of research that about 80 to 85 percent of people will be homeless once. They will solve their own homelessness and will never be homeless again. They may never walk into your door. They may never enter the homeless service system. But if they do, they're only going to need just a little bit of general housing help. About 15 people, 15% 15 of people who experience homelessness will need a small amount of financial assistance like rapid rehousing, and then they're going to be fine. They're going to be able to get out of homelessness quickly. About 5% of people are the ones that are really stuck in that black hole of homelessness, and they're going to be homeless for a very long term, uh, long time, and they're going to need the most intensive supports. So through the combination of questions in the VI SPDAT and even in the SPDAT products, we can determine who in our communities fit into these categories to help us better serve those who are experiencing homelessness. All right, so when we're setting up the VSPDAT, we'll dive into the actual uh, tools here. As we're setting up the VSPDAT, um, we want to keep in mind that the tool um, and the administration of the survey should not take any more than five to seven minutes. It's really um, only getting it yes, no, and one word answers. We're not needing every um, detail about the client's situation. We're really just looking for the presence of an issue. It's a survey. Um, it's important to uh, tell the client being surveyed that the questions can be skipped or refused. That is an option. And you do need to consent to the information being captured and the photo being taken if you uh, elect to do that in your community. And it's also important to uh, reiterate that honesty is very important. And we'll talk about that here in a minute when we talk about the uh, uh, script. Okay, so the opening script. So every assessor in your community, regardless of the organization completing the VS, should use the same introductory script so that we make sure that the survey is being administered in the same way. That script should highlight the following information. So your COC should really develop this script that uh, should be communicated to every organization that's using the VI, and uh, it should be implemented into your coordinated entry policies. And, and how do we, um, you know, how do we really administer this? And what do we say to every client who's receiving a VI SPDAT? So we should include the name of the assessor and their affiliation. So um, where are they um, employed? or is this part of the PIT count, or how, how, is, this, um, how is this person um, qualified to give this assessment? The purpose of the VI SPDAT being completed, that it usually takes no less than seven minutes to complete, or between five to seven minutes, that only yes, no, and one word answers are being sought at this time, that questions can be skipped or refused, where the information is going to be stored. So if this is, um, if your community only stores them via paper, or is the information going to be stored in the local HMIS? 
um, that the participant does not understand a question or the assessor does not understand the question or the answer, the clarification can be provided. And it should also include the importance of relaying accurate information to the assessor and not feeling that there is a correct or preferred answer that they need to provide nor information that they need to conceal. So your script may look something like this. My name is Amanda and I work for a group called OrgCode. I have a short survey that, uh, that I would like to complete with you. The answers will help us determine um, how we can go about supporting your, you and your housing the most. Most questions only require a yes or no answer. Some questions require a one word answer. I'll be honest, some questions are personal in nature, but know that you can skip or refuse any question that you choose to. The information collected goes into our local homeless management information system, which is a database that collects information on people who are experiencing homelessness. So you could talk about your data privacy requirements there. If you're unclear about what I'm asking, just let me know and I will try to clarify it for you. Also, if I'm unsure about your answer, I'll ask you to clarify it for me. The last thing that we need to chat about is that I've been doing this for a very long time and I know that some people will tell me what they want me to hear rather than telling me or even themselves the truth. It's up to you, but the more honest you are, the better we can figure out how to best support you. If you're dishonest with me, really you're just being dishonest with yourself. So please answer as honestly as you feel comfortable doing. So that honesty piece is really key to um, just put it out there that some of the things that um, you know, your clients might tell you, it's okay, we're not gonna be judgmental, um, and we've been doing this for a very long time, um, so nothing you're gonna tell me is really gonna surprise me. So let's get into the survey. Okay, so first part of the survey, I'm looking for my surveys. Um, the first part of the survey is the information about the interviewer. So who's administering the survey? What agency are they with? Is this a team, a staff, a volunteer? Where's the survey being completed? What date and what time is it being completed? So this is looking at, uh, just for clarification, this is the VI SPDAT version 2.0 for single adults. And then we'll go into the family and then we'll go into the transition age youth. Basic information and demographic in nature um, and in HMIS helps to ensure deduplication of clients. So the basic information tab is going to, or uh, section is going to create, uh, uh, collect information on the client. First name, last name, and any nicknames that they might go by. What language do they feel best able to express themselves, their date of birth, their age, their social security number, and are they consenting to the survey, yes or no? So if the person is 60 years of age or older, we're gonna then score a one. So it's really important that um, if you're doing this on paper and not within your HMIS, it's automatically gonna calculate for you. It's best practice is that you answer all the questions and then go back and score after the fact so that you're not trying to score as you're trying to administer the survey to the client as well. It's just a best practice. Okay, section A talks about the history of housing and homelessness. So question one is where did you sleep, where do you sleep most frequently? So we're looking at um, shelters, transitional housing, safe haven, outdoors, or other, specific, and then specify where that other would be, or would the client refuse that question? If the person answers anything uh, other than shelter, or transitional housing, or safe haven, then we're gonna score a one. So we're looking at um, folks who are living outdoors um, being more vulnerable than people who are living in shelters already or transitional housing. Question two, how long has it been since you lived in a permanent stable housing? Question three, it's often most helpful for reference um, or to reference the time. So you might say something like uh, since 2014 or since uh, November or even since Thanksgiving of 2014, how many times have you been homeless? So some folks who have been homeless for a very long time, um, you may need to reference the year rather than just in the last three years. And then if the person has experienced homeless one or more consecutive years of homelessness and or four plus episodes of homelessness, then we're gonna score a one. 
again, looking at more vulnerable being um, longer term homelessness. Okay, section B of the single. So this is looking at the risks section. In the past six months, how many times have you, A, received health care in an emergency department or room, taken to an ambulance, taken an ambulance to the hospital, been hospitalized as an inpatient, used a crisis service, including sexual assault crisis, mental health crisis, family intimate violence, distress centers, and suicide prevention hotlines, talk to police because you witnessed a crime or the victim of a crime or the alleged perpetrator of a crime or because the police told you that you must move along, stayed one or more nights in a holding cell, jail, or prison, whether that was for a short, short term stay like the drunk tank, a longer stay for a more serious offense or anything in between. So we're gonna total up um, the total number of interactions. And if that equals four or more total interactions, then we're gonna score a one for emergency service use. So all questions um, should be uh, read as they are written. And again, you can provide some clarification, but it's really important to use the language that is written on the BI SPIT app. Five, have you been attacked or beaten up since you've become homeless? Yes or no or refused. Six, have you threatened to or tried to harm yourself or anyone else in the last year? Yes, no, or refused. If yes to any of the above, being number five or number six, then you're gonna score a one for risk of harm. Number seven, do you have any legal stuff going on right now that may result in you being locked up, having to pay fines, or that make it more difficult to rent a place to live? Yes, no, or refused. If it's yes, then we're gonna score a one for legal issues. Eight, does anybody force or trick you to do things that you do not wanna do? Yes, no, or refused. Nine, do you ever do, you ever do things that may be considered to be risky, like exchange sex for money, run drugs for someone, have unprotected sex with someone that you don't know, share a needle, or anything like that. This leaves it open for the client to uh, determine what they consider risky, yes, no, or refused. If yes to either eight or nine, then we're gonna score a one for risk of exploitation. Again, the way that the questions are written has been researched to ensure that the most accurate information is given during the survey. So you'll see um, the wording, do you have any legal stuff or um, anything like that? Uh, again, it leaves it open for the client to uh, kind of give their own uh, personal interpretation of that answer. Okay, the remainder of page six discusses socialization and daily functioning and also includes questions about money management and self-care. So looking at number uh, section C, number 10 and 11, is there any person, past landlord, business, bookie, dealer, government group like the IRS that thinks you owe them money? Not that you owe money to, but that thinks you owe them money. Again, the wording is really important. Yes, no, or refused. Do you get any money from the government, a pension, an inheritance, working under the table, a regular job, or anything like that? Yes, no, or refused. So here's where the scoring gets a little, um, a little different. So if yes to question 10, so anybody thinks you owe them money, or no to question 11, then we're score, gonna score a one for money management. And if you take note, um, the question, or the answer that is bold is the answer that's gonna uh, indicate the score. So if yes, which is bold in number 10, uh, you're going to score a one. If no in question 11, then you're going to score a one. So um, that, that kind of carries throughout the entire uh, tool as well. Number 12, do you have any planned activities other than just surviving that make you feel happy and fulfilled? If no, then score a one for meaningful daily activities, which again is bolded. 13, are you currently able to take care of basic needs like bathing, changing clothes, using a restroom, getting food and clean water and other things like that? If it's no, bold, then score a one. Uh, 14, is your current homelessness in any way caused by a relationship that broke down, an unhealthy or abusive relationship, or because family or friends caused you to become evicted? Yes, no, or refused. If it's yes, then we're gonna score a one there. All right, the remainder of the questions, um, pages seven and eight, focus on issues surrounding uh, wellness. So section D is the wellness section. 
these questions address uh, issues including physical health, mental health, and substance abuse. So 15, have you ever had to leave an apartment, shelter program, or other place you were staying because of your physical health? Number 16, do you have any chronic health issues with your liver, kidneys, stomach, lungs, or heart? Yes, no, or refused. Number 17, if there was a space available, this is a question that I always tend to have, I get a little confused look from my clients and um, I'll have to kind of reword it and re-explain it. So if there was space available in a program that specifically assists people that live with HIV or AIDS, would that be of interest to you? So oftentimes uh, I'll get the, I'm sorry, I don't understand the question, or they'll just kind of give me a, a perplexed look. I'll say, okay, there's certain programs um, that specifically help people who have HIV or AIDS. Would you want to go into a program like that? And then they'll say, oh, no, 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 I don't have AIDS, or yes, I would be of interest of that. So um, you may have to reframe that question a little bit. Do you have any physical disabilities that would limit the type of housing you could access or would make it hard to live independently because you need help? Yes, no, or refused. Number 19, when you're when you are sick or not feeling well, do you avoid getting help? Yes, no, or refuse. Number 20 is only for female respondents. So we're asking, are you currently pregnant or um, not applicable or not refused? Yes or no. If yes to any of these questions between 15 and 20, then we're going to score a one for physical health. So they may only have a class, they may only be pregnant, but we're still going to score a one for, for uh, physical health. All right, number 21, has your drinking or drug use led to you being kicked out of an apartment or program where you were staying in the past, or will drinking or drugs may use make it difficult for you to stay housed or afford your housing? If yes to 21 or 22, um, then score a one for substance abuse. It could be yes for both of them, but we're still gonna only score a one. Number 23, have you ever had trouble maintaining your housing or been kicked out of an apartment, shelter program, or other place you were staying because of any of these three issues? A mental health issue or concern, a past head injury, a learning disability, developmental disability, or other impairment? Yes, no, or refused on each of those. Number 24, do you have any mental health or brain issues that would make it hard for you to live independently because you'd need help? If yes to any of these, then we're going to score a one for mental health. So if the respondent scored a one for physical health and a one for substance use and a one for mental health, then we're going to score an additional one for trimorbidity. So that's going to require you to go back and look at the physical health section under D. And then we're going to look at questions 21 and 22 and 23 and 24. So did you score one on all three of those? If you did, then we're going to score an additional one. So 25 and 26 regards medication. Are there any medications that a doctor said you should be taking that uh, for whatever reason you're not taking? Are there any medications like painkillers that you don't take the way the doctor prescribed or where you sell the medication? If yes to either 25 or 26, then we're gonna score a one for medications. And then number 27, uh, yes or no, this one does need to be uh, delivered in the way that it's written. Has your current period of homelessness been caused by an experience of emotional, physical, psychological, sexual, or other type of abuse, or by any other trauma that you've experienced? If they say yes, then we're gonna score a one for abuse and trauma. The last page, uh, page eight, contains the scoring summary. So we're gonna carry the scores from section A, B, C, and D back to the scoring summary, and then we're gonna total it up. So um, total number of, uh, total number possible would be a 17. So if this person scores between a zero and three, this is a recommendation of no housing intervention. That's gonna be those 80 to 85% who just might need a little bit of case management, maybe some diversion assistance and helping them figure out uh, what's going on with uh, you know, their housing issues so that they could stay where they are maybe. Um, if they score between a four and a seven, this is our 15% that needs a, a assessment for rapid rehousing or might be referred to a rapid rehousing program. And then if they score uh, eight plus, that's our 5%, 
These are the folks that are high acuity and would probably uh, need a referral to permanent supportive housing or housing first. Follow-up questions uh, on the back page, uh, really key for the street outreach workers. If you're administering this in the, uh, in the field, out in the street, on a regular day, where is it easiest to find you and what time of day is it easiest to do so? So where could I find you um, again? Is there a phone number where I could reach you or an email message or an email that I could leave you a message? And if you do choose to take a picture, we do want to get consent to take a picture. I know some HMISs do have uh, picture capabilities that you could upload uh, to the client profile or to the client's record within HMIS. So you want to gain that consent before you do that as well. And then you're also encouraged to think of any additional questions that might be relative to the programs being operated in your local community. So you may include additional questions related to military service, uh, aging out of foster care, mobility, legal status, income sources, restrictions on where the person can legally reside, uh, children that may reside with the adult at some point in the future. So um, if they're not a family now, might they be a family in the future? safety planning, et cetera. So we'll move on to the transition age youth VI. This is version one. So this is the next uh, steps for homeless youth tool. I'm not gonna go as deep into this, but I do wanna just point out some of the, the differences because the transition age youth is very similar to the single adult VI, but there are some um, minor differences as well. Administration. Again, this is going to stay the same in collecting the interviewer's name and agency and where the survey is being completed, et cetera. Um, basic information, also the same. However, the change here is that you score a one for persons who are age 17 and under rather than 60 and older. So we're looking at those, uh, those unaccompanied youth that are under 17 as being more vulnerable. Okay, the addition in um, section A is uh, for couch surfing for youth. So in addition to shelters, transitional housing, safe haven, we also have uh, the choice of couch surfing uh, because we know that many youth do uh, couch surf, which could be a vulnerable situation uh, that they're in uh, for one reason or another. So if the person answers anything other than shelter, transitional housing, or safe haven, we're going to score a one. So even if they are couch surfing as a youth, we are going to score one for that. Uh, question two and question three are the same regarding the length of time uh, homeless. Uh, the risks section, uh, question four. Addition of uh, in item F, stayed one or more nights in a holding cell, jail, prison, or juvenile detention uh, facility. Not much other changes here. Questions five and six, uh, no change. However, question eight, were you ever incarcerated when younger than age 18? So we're getting at uh, uh, youth that may have been uh, incarcerated uh, in juvenile detention facilities as well. No other uh, changes on legal issues or risk of exploitation. No real changes on socialization and daily functioning as well. Um, 11 and 12 are the same. 13 is also the same. Scoring is also the same as is 14 for self-care scoring is also the same. Okay, there's a little bit of different wording on the relationships section. So question 15 is your current lack of stable housing. A, because you ran away from your family home, a group home or foster care, because of a difference in religious or cultural beliefs from your parents, guardians or caregiver, caregivers, C, because your family or friends cause you to become homeless. D, because of conflicts around gender identity or sexual orientation. And then uh, if we're scoring, if we're answering yes to any of those, then we're going to score a one for social relationships. Uh, e and F, because of violence at home between your family members. 
uh, F because of an unhealthy or abusive relationship either at home or elsewhere. So the wording on these um, are slightly different in this section as well. So if yes to E or F, then we're going to score a one for abuse and trauma. Okay, the wellness question, not many uh, changes until we get to question 21. So question 20, uh, I think it was question 20 and the other one was for female respondents only. 21 is, are you currently pregnant? Have you ever been pregnant? Or for gentlemen, have you ever gotten someone pregnant? So we're looking at vulnerability there. Yes, no, or refused. If yes to any of the above, then we're gonna score a one for physical health. Okay, a little bit different questions on the substance use section. 24, if you uh, have ever used marijuana, did you ever try it at age 12 or younger? So we're looking at uh, early substance, uh, substance use. So if yes to any of the above, above then we're gonna score a one for substance use. No other uh, real issue or real changes on the mental health section. Again, if the respondent scored one for physical health and one for substance use and one for mental health, then we're gonna score one for tremorbidity as well. So no changes there. No changes on medication. Medications, as doctor said, you should be taking that you're not. Any medications like painkiller killers that you uh, don't take the way you're, they're prescribed or that you sell if yes to these or any of these, we're gonna score a one for medication, so no changes there. No changes in the scoring either. Uh, the transition age youth is very similar to uh, the single, uh, again, with some slight variations of the wording on some questions. Scoring criteria stays the same. Total possible points of 17. Zero to three is our no moderate or high intensity services at this time. Four to seven is long or uh, time limited supports with moderate intensity or that rapid rehousing housing range eight plus is long-term housing with high service intensity or that uh, permanent supportive housing housing first same follow-up questions as well again where do we find you uh, how do we get in touch with you and can we take a picture just check in the questions box real quick. Okay, we'll keep moving along. So the VI spit out version 2.0 for families. There are some uh, slight changes here as well as uh, in the way of the wording and the scoring. All right, so administration section, no change. Basic information. So you'll see the addition of uh, person one, parent, parent one, and parent two. So uh, if there's no second parent currently part of the household, obviously we would not fill out the second parent section. If either head of household is 60 years of age or older, then we're gonna score a one. So either person in the household, uh, either adult can be, uh, uh, can be 60 or over and we're gonna score a one regardless of which one it is. So the children uh, section is after uh, the basic information. So how many children under the age uh, under the age of 18 are currently with you? How many are not currently with your family, but you have reason to believe they'll be joining uh, your family when you get housed? And the pregnancy question shows up here in the basic information. So if the household includes a female, is any member of the family currently pregnant? And then we're gonna provide a list of the children's uh, names and ages as well, and date of birth. So if there's a single parent with two or more children and or a child aged 11 or younger and or a current pregnancy, then we're gonna score a one for family size. If there's current, if there are two parents with three or more children and or a child aged six or younger, and or a current pregnancy, then we're gonna score a one for family size. So we wanna uh, definitely do this scoring after the fact so that we can really look at how the person answered the questions, how many people fall under which age categories in the household. History of housing and homelessness. This doesn't really differ from the 
a single viaspidat, so we're looking at where do you and your family sleep most often. If they answer anything other than shelter, transitional housing, or safe haven, then we're going to score a one for vulnerability. How long has it been since you and your family lived in permanent stable housing? In the last three years, how many times have you and your family been homeless? So again, we're scoring a one if it's one or more uh, consecutive years of homelessness and or four or more episodes of homelessness, then we're gonna score a one. So the theme throughout this one is the language in uh, that it includes you or anyone in your family. So you can answer this, um, uh, for every adult in the, or for either adult in the household. So in the past six months, how many times have you or anyone in your family experienced, uh, received healthcare in an emergency room, taken an ambulance to the hospital, been hospitalized as an inpatient, used a crisis service, talked to police, stayed one or more nights in a holding cell, et cetera. So if the total number of interactions equals four or more, then we're gonna score a one for emergency service use. So if dad has went to the hospital and mom was hospitalized as an inpatient, so we're gonna have one on B, one on C, and the total interactions would be two. Um, so we're gonna total up for everybody, um, including the person who's being interviewed and anyone else in the household. That makes sense. Okay, question nine. Have you or anyone in your family been attacked or beaten up since you've become homeless? Have you or anyone in your family threatened to or tried to harm themselves? If yes to either, we're gonna score one. Uh, anyone in your family have any legal stuff going on? Again, we're gonna score one if they say yes. Uh, does anyone force or trick you or anyone in your family to do things you don't wanna do? If yes, we're gonna score one. Do, anyone, do you or anyone in your family ever do things that might be considered risky? So if yes to either 12 or 13, then we're gonna score one. Again, the language doesn't change much here, only that it includes you or anyone in your family. Socialization and daily functioning, the language is not really changing here either. Uh, no change on meaningful daily activities or self-care or social relationships. No changes on wellness. So again, we're looking at, uh, has your family ever had to leave an apartment or a shelter? Do you have any chronic health conditions with your liver, kidneys, stomach, lungs, or heart? Um, anything to do with physical health? So if yes to any of these questions, we're gonna score a one. Drinking or drug use by you or anyone in your family led to your family being kicked out of an apartment or program where you were staying in the past. 25, will drinking or drugs make it difficult for you or your family to stay housed or afford your housing? If yes to either, then we're gonna score a one for substance use. Number 26, has your family ever had trouble maintaining your housing, been kicked out of an apartment or shelter or place you were staying because of a mental health issue, past head injury, learning disability? Uh, yes, no, or refused on either of those. Do you or anyone in your family have any mental health or brain issues that would make it hard for you to live independently? So if yes to any of those, and we're gonna score one for mental health. If the family scored one each for physical health, substance use, and mental health. Does any single member of your household have a medical condition, mental health concerns, and experience uh, with substance use? If yes, score one for trimorbidity. So if the family scored, then we're gonna look, uh, if the family scored in physical health, substance use, and mental health, we're gonna look at any single member of your household that has any of those uh, physical health, mental health, and experience substance abuse. If a single person has yes on all three of those, then we're gonna score a one for trimorbidity. If mom only has a physical health issue and dad only has a substance use issue, then we wouldn't score a one for trimorbidity. So 29 and 30, are there any medications? Uh, again, any medications like painkillers, uh, et cetera? Yes, no, refuse, no change there. Um, no real change on 31 as well, other than has your family's current uh, period of homelessness been caused by uh, any trauma or abuse, et cetera. Okay, so in the family VI, uh, we have the addition of family unit questions. This section is an additional section increasing the overall score from the family VI from 17 to 22. 
So family unit number 32, are there any children that have been removed from the family by a child protective service within the last 180 days? You might wanna say six months. Yes, no, or refused. Do you have any family legal issues that are being resolved in court or need to be resolved in court that would impact your housing or, uh, or you may live or, or may live within your housing, excuse me. If yes to any of the above, score one for family legal issues. So yes to either 32 or 33, then we're gonna score one. 34, 35, and 36. Um, in the last 180 days or in the last six months, or uh, you might wanna reference since, maybe since March. Um, have any children lived with family or friends because of your homelessness or housing situation? Yes, no, or refuse. Number 35, has any child in the family experienced abuse or trauma in the last 180 days or six months or reference the month? Number 36, if there are school-age children, so only uh, if children are of school age, you're gonna ask this question, do your children attend school, school more often than not each week? So are they attending school at least three to four days a week? If yes, to any of the questions 34 or 35, so if yes to 34 or yes to 35, or no to question 36, then we're gonna score a one for needs of the children. So they can answer yes to 34 or 35, or they can answer no to question 36, and we're still gonna score a one, regardless of uh, the answers. So one, uh, if it's yes, yes, no, exactly. Okay, so have the members of your family changed in the last six months, 180 days, due to things like divorce, your kids coming back to live with you, someone leaving for military service or incarceration, a relative moving in, or anything like that, yes, no, or refused. Number 38, do you anticipate any other adults or children coming to live with you within the first 180 days of being housed? So if we get you housed, in the next six months, is someone going to come live with you? If yes to either of those, score one for family stability. Number 39, do you have two or more planned activities each week as a family, such as outings to the park, going to the library, visiting other family, watching a family movie, or anything like that? It allows them to interpret what they uh, see as being a fulfilling planned activity. Yes, no, or refused. Number 40, after school or on week weekends or days when there isn't school, is the total time children spend each day where there is no interaction with you or another responsible adult for A, three or more hours per day for children age 13 or older. So 13 and older, do they have three or more hours per day? And B, two or more hours per day for children ages 12 and, and younger. So if there are children both 12 and under and 13 and over, do your older kids spend two or more hours on a typical day helping their younger siblings with things like getting ready for school, helping with homework, making them dinner, bathing them, or anything like that? So if no to question 39 or yes to any of the questions in 40 or 41, then we're gonna score one for parental engagement. So we're looking at vulnerability, um, uh, for parental engagement. Are the parents engaged with the children or not? So this is where the increase comes in. So we have that uh, additional four points for the family unit. So it bumps our score up to 22. The recommendations, uh, zero to three, no housing intervention, four to eight, an assessment for rapid rehousing. And this is the change of uh, uh, nine plus an assessment for permanent supportive housing. So instead of four to seven and eight plus, we're looking at four to eight and nine plus on the family unit. No changes with the follow-up questions, but here's a snapshot of the, um, the VSPDAT scoring. So no housing help, for the single would be zero to three, family zero to three, and transition age youth zero to three. And then rapid rehousing on the single is four to seven, four to eight, and four to seven. And then PSH housing first is eight plus, nine plus, and eight plus. Total possible points being 17 on the single, 
22 on the family and 17 on the uh, transition age youth. Just a couple more slides, and, and uh, Craig, that is about all I have um, for this. So we want to look at the frequency for undertaking of the VI spit at. Just a couple rules of thumb here. Um, we're going to do it at the initial pre-screen, and then we're only going to do it if there are changes in a person's life, uh, updates to the VI spit at as their prioritization may have changed. Um, and we do not want to complete a pre-screen for the sake of completing a pre-screen. Our rule of thumb in West Virginia is that unless there are significant changes to the person's life, we only do a pre-screen every six months because many of those questions in there re, uh, refer back to the last 180 days or the last six months, especially with the family to be asked for that. And that is all I have. Are there any questions? I'm watching the question board as they come in. I haven't really seen. I actually have okay. one. Okay. Um, I stop my screen and, and flip my contact information up here real quick. Go ahead with the question. Uh, why so many different stats? <laughs> um, I, why so many? Um, yeah. Because there's so many different. Um, you know, needs of like the needs of a family are very different than the needs of a single and our needs of a youth are very, very different than than the needs of families or singles. So um, again, looking at very client centered, um, what's the need of the client and how can we best meet the needs of the client um, on their characteristics? Are there any subpopulations that should not use the VS for that? Any hmm, good question? I don't. Not that I've encountered. Okay, let's see. We will send out the materials. I think you've answered all the questions that came in. Anybody have any more or feel free to ask any questions while we got time today? Last ones. Thank you, man. That was a really good presentation. I was not as fluent with PS to that now, and I feel like I am a little bit. You're welcome. And there's my contact information, um, my West Virginia-based cell phone number, and then my org code email. So if you have questions, you can certainly email them to me. And um, you do have you do have uh, copies of all the the tools: the family, the single, and the transition age youth. Do you have do you have copies of them, Greg? Yeah, I believe so. I was about I was just typing. You send them to me. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I've got the recording. So after this close of this, I'm going to send all the reference, your materials, all three versions of the spadat, and a recording for the link so you can pass them on. Okay, and I can I can PDF the slides and send them to you as well if you want those. Um, we do have a question. Do the clients need to sign? Do they need to sign the BS spadat or consent form before? Before or after the questions? Before. All right. Any, any other questions, y'all? Uh, how can one fill out this VS cadet out of HMIS that is currently not in the HMIS system? I'm sorry, you cut out a little bit. What was yeah. the question? How can one fill out a VS cadet out of HMIS that is currently not in the HMIS system? So how do you pull it out if it's not in there? I think that's what it, I mean, is that what you're asking? Okay. I mean, I would just recommend doing it on paper. Um, if it's not in your HMIS system, I would just do it on paper and and go from there with whatever your coordinated entry process is, whether it's, you know, local prioritization groups, you know, regional groups getting together. I would do it on paper and bring it to those meetings or to the take it to your coordinated entry uh, as a paper VS for that. Um, that's what we do sometimes in West Virginia because we do have entities that aren't on HMIS. 
So they're doing paper VASFID ads and then either calling the coordinated entry or taking it to the local coordinated entry group uh, and manually feeding it into that prioritization process. Yes. Yeah, I think so. Thank you, guys. There's any more questions, y'all? I'm trying much longer earlier today, so you guys have an hour to yourself. Yeah, that went really quick. <laughs> it did, actually. <laughs> I think that's but I'll it. PDF the slides and I'll send them to you. And if anyone has any questions, um, you have my contact information. Certainly, you know, shoot me an email or give me a call. So awesome. Well, thank you for your time today, Amanda. Really appreciate it. Thanks for um, me. So the rest of y'all, we do have another ORCO training. I believe it's in two weeks. I will send out the reminders to the registrants today. Um, again, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us anytime. We're here to support you. Okay. Thanks, Craig. Bye, Amanda. Bye.